The people at home can see. Hello. Um, can the people in Zoom hear me? Hello. Can the people in Zoom hear me? Okay. The people in Zoom have to wait for a while because the there's some technical issue in the lecture theater that I cannot resolve yet. How come there are more people in my tutorial than here? Uh, I know how to on sometimes. Oh, yeah. This one, right? I, I tried this one off, off and on already. Oh. Uh, yeah, but we can try again. Basically, I want this one to show. Oh. Yeah. Hello? Hello? Uh, so the, the people in Zoom uh, wait for a while, okay? Oh. <laughs> yeah. The projector not fit now. Uh, no, no projector here, yeah. Sometimes it's possible. Sometimes I know how to make this work on myself, by myself. Movement. Around. Hello? Yeah. 
Uh, the people in Zoom, sorry. Yeah, wait for a while. Otherwise, we will do <laughs> no choice if we will do pure Zoom. Okay, there's some hope. Okay, thank you very much. How come is this yellow thing? Will this yellow thing go away? Okay, let's, let's hope the yellow thing goes away, otherwise. All right, but uh, without further ado, let's get started. Uh. Let's, let me not try to write on the yellow thing. <laughs> okay, good, good. Uh, sorry, everybody, for the slight delay. Okay, so today we are going to talk about lecture seven. Okay, the reading is, um, where's the reading? Section 2.4 and 2.5 of the book, and you must read it even though I will cover most, if not all of the examples, okay? So today we will continue our discussion on mean and variance of some common discrete random variables. And then we will talk about the very, very important joint probability mass function, very important, okay? Uh, this is something probably new. You may not have seen it before in um, JC or Poly. Maybe everything, you have, everything we have covered up to now, you have seen before in some way or another. So I just want to recall, because it's been some time, some uh, common notions, okay? The first thing is, uh, what is the expectation of a discrete random variable? Okay, a discrete random variable. So RV is random variable. So roughly speaking, it's the average, okay? Or the mean, there are different ways of saying it. So our discrete random variable is going to be called X and the expectation is denoted by this strange thing, E. I have this notation E and the book also has notation E of X, okay? So this is a number, all right? This is a number and it's given the, by the formula sum over all possible values of X, X, P or X of X. Here, P, X of X is known as the probability mass function and it's the probability that X takes on the value little x probability mass function. Okay, so that's very important. Okay, welcome. So um, that is the expectation. Now, uh, when we write this, we mean we are taking the sum over all possible values of X. All possible values of X. So, so we, we typically don't make this explicit uh, because we are very lazy. Okay, but it should be understood that we take, X, we take uh, the sum over all possible values of X. Now, the variance of a discrete random variable is given this notation VAR of X and is uh, denoted by the expectation of a new random variable, which is the expectation value of X minus a certain number. And a certain number is the expectation value of X. Okay, squared like that. Okay, so this is nothing but a function of X. It's a function of X and it's a very special quadratic function of X. You take away the mean and then you square it. So that is a certain function. And then after that, there is a brand new random variable. This is a brand new random variable. And then we can take its expectation. And last time I talked about this, but I'm not gonna talk about it anymore. You can take a function of a certain random variable, you get a new random variable, and then you can take the expectation of both of these guys, okay? So last time we talked about this before. So this is our function of that random variable, okay? Now, of course you can write this in long form. You sum over all possible values of X, X minus the expectation value of X, quantity squared, and you multiply it by the probability mass function PXX, okay? So that is that, that's good, okay? So there's nothing but just the definition of the expectation of a function. Basically you put the function here, and you, you put down the probability mass function here. This is a special case in which the function is just the identity function and X is nothing but X here, okay? So here the X gets transformed to a special function. So you put down a special function here. And last time we verified through a simple, if you wish, proof that this is expectation value of X squared minus expectation value of X whole thing squared. So this is the, this one has a name, this is called the second moment. 
the mean or the expectation is also called the first moment. So the variance is actually the second moment minus the first moment squared, all right? So these are some things that we talked about last time and I will not belabor the point anymore. So I assume you know all this and you will do a lot of calculations on these things uh, in the tutorial and in the homework. The homework I'm trying to prepare, I'm preparing the second one now, okay? So recall what is a Bernoulli random variable. A Bernoulli random variable is a zero one value random variable. So it takes on values zero one only, zero one value random variable. It's also called a binary random variable sometimes. Px of k, the probability mass function is denoted as follows. P represents the probability of success. And that happens when k is equal to one. So that represents, for example, hits happening. A hit happens with probability P and tails happens with probability one minus P. So you notice sometimes we use this, the argument here, the, the value here that is inside the function. Sometimes we use little x, sometimes we use K. Now you should be familiar with both. Typically when we use K, we mean that K is an integer, all right? But sometimes we are very uh, laid back about such things. We don't have to worry too much, okay? So this is a zero and value random variable, okay? And uh, let's calculate the mean and the expectation. So the, expect, sorry, the, the expectation and the variance, the expectation value of X is nothing but the sum over all possible values of K. So now K runs from zero to one. You put the K here and you put PX of K here. All right. So now you see, okay, now K is equal to zero. Zero multiplied by the value of the probability at zero plus one multiplied by the value of the probability at one. So that's the formula, okay? So you get zero multiplied. What is the probability at zero is one minus P one times p, all right? So px of one is nothing but p, px of zero is nothing but one minus p. So this becomes p, so the expectation value is p, all right? So please stop me if you have any questions, okay? I'm, I don't have too many things to say today, right? We, we can finish. So now we want to compute the variance of x. So it is easiest actually to use the formula second moment minus the first moment quantity squared. It is easiest to, to, use, to do this because we already have this. This is given by P. So this, this part here is P squared. So we are good. So all we have to figure out is the, first mo the second moment. So the second moment, all right, we're gonna use the formula given by, so K squared PX of K. All right, why, why is this K squared? Because it's X squared. So you put that K squared here. So K again runs from zero to one, okay? So you have zero squared PX of zero plus one squared PX of one. So that yields zero squared times, uh, how much? One minus P plus one squared times P that yields P. So the second moment, wow, is the same as the first moment, okay? The second moment is the same as the first moment. So what is the variance? Okay, if you do the variance, variance of X is nothing but the second moment minus the first moment quantity squared. All right, so that becomes P minus P squared and we can factorize this, okay, as follows. So we can actually plot, and this is not in the book, all right, we can actually plot uh, the variance as a function of P. So here is our P. P can, the only meaningful values of P is between zero and one, uh, between zero and one, okay? The rest of the P's cannot, you know, Probabilities must be between zero and one, probability of success. So now you see this is a coin toss, right? When do you think the coin toss has the most variance, most variation, most diversity, if you wish, or most uh, randomness, randomness, variance is like randomness. Now, if you have a coin, which is always going to give you hate, then it's kind of boring. There's no diversity, right? So you can expect that its variance is zero. Similarly, if you have a coin that's always giving you tails, that's a really boring coin. So the variance is also zero. Now, conversely, if the probability is half, you get half heads, half tails most of the time, then that variance is super high. And in particular, this expression that we just derived here tells us exactly that because we can plot the variance as a function of P. And this hump is what we get. The variance is highest when P is equal to half and it attains the value one quarter. Okay, so that, so that actually confirms our intuition that for a coin, it is most random when it is unbiased. Unbiased means not biased. That means half-half probably, okay? Is that clear, all these calculations? 
this is a warm up for today. Is this clear? Uh, people in the audience? Anyone wants me to go slower, faster? I'm happy to. All right. Okay. So this is our first calculation. Now, um, now let me talk about other discrete uniform random variable, discrete random variables. Now, some of these calculations may become a little bit more involved. All right. So this is a discrete random variable that is uniform. All right. So we haven't actually discussed what is a uniform random variable, but that should be kind of obvious. Px of k is say one over six. All right. So we have a dice that only has six faces, no more, no less. And it is uniform in the sense that the probability that it takes on any one of its allowed values is equal to one over six. So the picture is as follows. So the probability mass function is given by the following simple graph. So this is Px of k and k is here. And the probability mass function takes on values given by one over six. Okay, one, two, all the way up to six. That's one over six. So now, since the expectation value, as I mentioned last time, but I didn't repeat it here, uh, represents the center of gravity, if you wish, of the probability mass function, it is not so difficult to just eyeball this. And we are not going to calculate this, but it's the center of gravity. Where's the center of gravity of these numbers here? One to six. Well, it's here, right? It's between three and four. Can you see? It's between, it must be between three and four, right? That's the center of gravity because we've got three sticks over here and we have three sticks over here. So that's the center of gravity of the, of the expectation value. You can use the standard formula to calculate this, but this is going to be three over two or seven, so three and a half or seven over two. So I'm not going to belabor the point and I'm not going to calculate this, okay? It's just the center of gravity. So that is where the mean is here. Expectation of X, okay? So hopefully you understand this and I don't have to calculate this. What I do want to calculate is the uh, second moment and the variance. Okay, the second moment is nothing but, well, we use the same old formula. Sum over all possible values of K. And now if I want to make, if I don't want to be so lazy, I can write K running from one to six of K squared PX of K. Now, so here all the PX of Ks are one over six, so they can be brought outside. So we are left with k squared all the way from k equals to one to six. So you can either put this in a calculator or you can do it by hand or whatever. But here's what you will get. This is 91 over six from my calculation yesterday. So now the variance, you're gonna plug it into the formula again, variance of x. That is nothing but the second moment. This is the second moment. Minus the first moment, quantity squared. That is 91 over 6 minus uh, 7 over 2 squared. And this is going to be 35 over 12. Okay. So this is some simple standard calculation here that you should be able to do. But uh, you can also go back and check that more generally, generally, for a discrete uniform, this is a uniform, by the way, random variable supported on A. A plus one all the way to B. So all these are integers, all right? All these are integers. Actually, it doesn't have to be integers, but let's say they are integers. The expectation value is in the middle. A plus B over two. And the variance is of X is equal to B minus A, B minus A plus two over 12. Don't ask me why are these numbers as follows, but they are what they are, okay? So for, for the case, uh, let's see whether these numbers are correct. So for this case, where the A is one and the B is six, if you plug this into here, you get five. Here you get seven. So five times seven, I think is 35 and over 12. So this formula is correct, okay? But this is something for you to check. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna do it in this lecture, okay? So, so these are some standard ways of calculating means and variances. And the next thing I wanna calculate is the mean of a Poisson. Okay, that is a little bit more challenging. So remember that a Poisson random variable is a random variable X, okay? We usually write this as, X Poisson lambda. Lambda is known as a rate, okay? Oh, there's a lot we can talk about when we talk about Poisson random variables. Lambda is known as a rate of the Poisson random variable, if you wish, okay? So the Poisson random variable has PMF given by the following ugly looking object, but it looks like the following, okay? So zero else, okay? E to the minus rate, rate to the power K over K factorial. 
So k runs from 0, 1 to, roughly speaking, a Poisson random variable represents how many customers come into your shop per unit time. And the average number of customers that come into your shop is the rate. That is something that we have not shown. And that is something that I will show right now. So this is the uh, this can represent actually the average number of customers, average number of people coming coming in to your shop. Okay. All right. So can we actually justify that this is actually the average number of people coming in? So that, so we have to calculate actually the, the expectation value of x. So the expectation value of x, let's just plug into the formula. So now k actually runs from. Where does k run from? It runs from zero all the way up to infinity of k, px of k. And the way, the reason why it runs from zero to infinity is because uh, the values that Poisson take on is from zero to infinity here. So you have to go this way, all right? So now let us plug some numbers in. So k and the e to the minus lambda lambda to the k over k factorial. Okay, how to do this? So the claim is this lambda, all right? The, the, the justification that this lambda is actually not so, not so difficult, but also not so easy. Uh, now you notice first and foremost that this can cancel one of the things here, all right? Because k factorial, you know, k factorial is equal to k times k minus one times k minus two dot 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 two times one. So one of this k here can cancel this, resulting in k minus one factorial, right? This part here, is nothing but k minus one factorial. So one of the k's can cancel, right? So we have that uh, this can be written as, uh, hang on, hang on. First and foremost, let me go from k equals to one to infinity because if you put k equals to zero, this whole thing gets killed because there's zero here. Zero times anything is zero. So you have k e to the minus lambda, lambda k over k factorial. Okay, but this, as I mentioned above, Right, as I mentioned above, you can kill one of the k. So you have k minus one factorial here, e to the minus lambda lambda to the k. All right, because you cancel one of the k, so you are left with k minus one factorial. So now, the the book actually suggests this. You you take out one of the lambdas. Okay, here you have lambda to the power k. Right, too many. I don't like that. You pick up one. All right, and you're left with k running from one to infinity, of e to the minus lambda lambda to k minus one over k minus one factorial. Now this actually is the end because now you can let um, uh, m equals to k minus one. You reparameterize a few things. Then this becomes lambda. m runs from zero to infinity, e to the minus lambda. Whenever you see k minus one, you replace by m. This is like change of variables and in integration, okay? So you have this. But now you notice that in fact, this is equal to nothing but one. Because that is exactly the probability mass function of a Poisson random variable. So the probability mass functions must always add up to one. And we justified this last time. So I'm not going to justify this again. So you're left with that this is lambda. And so that is the proof of the expectation being lambda. So here, there are a few little small little tricks uh, here and there that we have to play. Okay. Uh, David says, when you set the k index starting from zero, is that before or after you have changed the denominator? Before, before. We cannot do it after. Otherwise, there's a problem, okay? We need to do it before. So here, I first noticed that the k equals to zero term is identically equal to zero, okay? Then I can actually start from k equals to one that actually makes my life correct, all right? Otherwise, I get into some issues. Let me tell you that, okay? So we start from k equals to one here, and so we retain the same old expression. Now, we cancel one of the k's here. We have k minus one factorial, and we bring out one of the lambdas here to here, and we are left with this, but this is summable, and the fact of the matter is this sums to one, okay? And so we recover just the prefactor lambda. So as I mentioned, for a Poisson random variable, lambda is the average number of people coming to your shop. So that is justified by the expectation value of, of x following a Poisson random variable is exactly equal to lambda. 
So this small calculation is a little bit tricky, but you can do it. So as another exercise along the same lines, if you cannot do this, let me know. I will show you how to do it. You compute the second moment of x taking on a Poisson random variable, and you show that it's equal to lambda plus lambda squared. Show. That's an exercise for you. So with this, it is not so difficult to verify that the variance of x, where x is a Poisson random variable, is nothing but lambda as well. So very interestingly, the Poisson random variables, expectation and mean and variance are all the same and they're all equal to lambda. Okay, so that's the exercise for you. Please do it. Okay, I will, uh, let, I will tell you how to do it if you, if you have trouble. Okay, this is a little bit tricky, all right? So let, let us uh, attempt, okay? So this is the next thing I'm going to do is not in the book, but I decide to do it. Now, so you can take this down or anyway, I'm, I'm going to write this up hopefully in, uh, in, in handwriting that you can read. So uh, recall what is a geometric random variable. Okay, a geometric random variable X is the number of tosses you have to wait before you see the first head. All right, so it looks as it looks like uh, the following. It has a probability density, probability mass function, given by the following: k minus one times p. So here k runs from one, two, all the way up. All right, so zero otherwise. So unlike the Poisson random variable, this starts from one. It starts from one. Okay, it doesn't start from zero, but it also takes on uh, countably many, countable infinitely many values. So infinitely many values here, but it starts from one. Doesn't start from zero. Okay, that's a geometric random variables PMF. We saw this last time, and uh, now I want to show you how to calculate the expectation. But before I calculate the expectation of something, of this thing, let us get one fact out of the way. Okay, and I'm, gonna, I'm not going to prove this fact. If you have difficulty showing it, let me know. Okay, uh, this sort of thing is some analysis thing that uh, you don't need to know. Okay, but uh, let let me just state the fact, all right? So the fact is that um, the summation of k running from zero to infinity, maybe one is good enough, one to infinity of k a to the k minus one, that is one over one minus a squared. And this holds true for all a's that have absolute value less than one. Okay, so this sort of fact, right? Um, this is something that I teach people have to show in the math department, but this is something that you, you don't really need to know for the purposes of this class, you can assume it. Okay, this can be found on Wikipedia. All right, so we need this fact to show the expectation value of X, okay? So the expectation value of X, let's just plug into the same formula. So we sum up from K equals to one to infinity of K of the PMF of X, okay? Now, so this is uh, nothing but uh, sum K running from one to infinity of K one minus P, K minus one of P. I'm just plugging in the PMF, all right? So basically the interesting part of the PMF is here and I plugged it into this formula here. Can you see that? I'm not doing anything fancy, but you see that actually at this point, the P here does not depend on K, so it can be brought outside. And indeed that's what I will do. I will bring the P outside and I'm left with K running from one to infinity of k one minus p to the k minus one. Aha, now I'm in business because uh, this, sorry, uh, this infinite sum here follows this fact here, except that I need to take a to be one minus p, all right? And let's say the p is between zero and one, okay? Let's say the p is not equal to zero, okay? If the p is not equal to zero, one minus p is not equal to one. So there's no problem. Okay, so we can make use of the fact directly. And so we have P divided by one, okay, one minus one minus P squared, right? We take A here, we are taking A to be one minus P. So now after you have cleared some fractions and you have cancelled some things, you get one minus P. So that's the way you calculate the mean of a geometric, all right? So how to calculate the variance of a geometric uh, you need another formula that I'm not going to, 
I'm not going to state, but you need, you can imagine that you need something like that, a, k squared, a k minus one. You need something like that, right? So how do you get this sort of thing? Yeah, you need to do some little analysis uh, and uh, some differentiation here and there. So I'm not going to mention about this. You, if you're interested, okay, exercise, you can go and find out how to compute the variance of a geometric. Uh, geometric random variable. You can go and find out what it is and how to compute it and what formulas you need, okay? So you, these sort of things you can find out on your own. Uh, if you don't know, again, let me know. I'm happy to help, okay? But as you can see here for the mean, you need an additional fact here. Uh, how to show this, I can tell you, but you don't need to know. So I'm not gonna tell you now. So as long as you know how to plug this thing in, plug in the probability mass function here and how to make use of this hint here, where we take A equals to one minus P so that, so that you have this P retained here. This P is retained. I'm not doing anything funny to it. Okay, this is retained here. And this infinite sum, this infinite sum here, this infinite sum part uh, yields or gives us the denominator here upon using the fact. Okay, then we have some cancellations and we have one over P. Okay, so now if, so you can see here the following, okay. The geometric represents number of times you wait, number of time steps you wait, not want, till you see the first hit. Okay, so P is the probability of hit. Okay, so now suppose the P is super small. If P is say one over 100, okay, super small. Then you can imagine that you have to wait a long time, right? Because the head only appears one out of a hundred times. So the average number of time steps you have to wait is one over P, which is hundred. And that makes sense, right? Because the smaller this probability, the longer you have to wait. Does that make sense? David, you're not here today, are you? Do you agree with me? This makes a lot of sense. Uh, Liao Xue, okay. Oliver, you understand? So the point here is that, okay, if, you're, if, if you have a coin and its probability of heads is kind of small, like one over 100, then you have to wait a long time to see the head, right? But how long is long? It's one over P and P is one over 100. So one out of one over P is, uh, I think you know it's 100 here. You have to extract this number here. So you have to wait on average 100 throws before you see a hit, which makes a lot of sense, right? So suppose this is like one over 1 million, then you have to wait 1 million time steps, okay? In order for you to meet a hit, okay? So that is the intuition, okay? After we have done all this math, okay? So now, we have already computed a few uh, expectations and variances of some random variables, and I will leave you to compute, to do all these exercises if you wish, okay? So now I wanna talk about something actually new because actually I didn't see this in um, JC. Uh, I, I, I come from JC, I never saw this when I was in JC. So this must be new, okay, to you. Join PMF of multiple random variables. Okay, so please read section 2.5. Okay, so let's consider two discrete random variables, X and Y. Now, why, why in the world we even consider this? Is it just for us to, is it just for us to um, feel good about ourselves that we know a lot of things? No, because oftentimes there are multiple random phenomena that we would like to analyze. For example, uh, X is my exam score. Why is Oliver's exam score? Does Oliver's exam score have any influence on my exam score? Condition on Oliver getting A, what is the probability that I will get A? All right, so X and Y have some relationship. And so we want to understand precisely what is the sort of relationship between X and Y, okay? So the joint probab... So we are interested in, for example, the joint is a joint probability that X is equal to little x, and y is equal to little y, okay? 
So we write that as probability of the event x is equal to x intersect y is equal to y. Okay, so that's a joint event. Two things are happening at the same time. Now, we don't like to write so many brackets and so many intersections. So usually we abbreviate this to x equals to x comma y is equal to y. Okay, uh, this is understood. Okay, and furthermore, we abbreviate this to be the joint PMF, P of xy, little xy. That's called a joint PMF or joint probability mass function. Okay, so the interpretation is as follows, and I, I'm going to use a picture, a nice picture from the book. Interpretation. Okay, so here X and Y can take on four different values. Okay, so we have this box here. And four different values. So here x can take on one, two, three, four, and y can take on values one, two, three, four as well. And there are some special values inside here. Zero, 20, sorry, this will take some time to write down, but I think I have to write this down. Anyway, I'm gonna write it once. actually that uh, is going to be useful. So what am I drawing out? Okay, so each box here represents P of X, Y, X, Y. So for example, this box that I've just highlighted here represents P of X, Y when X takes on the value four and Y takes on the value three. Okay, so that's actually what is represented by this little box or this little entry of the matrix. Now, so all the entries of this particular matrix here represent the joint probability that x is equal to a little value x and y is equal to some little value y. Now, what do all these numbers have to satisfy? What properties do these numbers in red have to satisfy? Uh, first and foremost, let me check. Three plus the seven, eight, nine, yeah, okay. So I'm, I'm correct. So what, what do I have to check when I write this down? All these numbers have to be, can, can, I have, can there be a negative number in there? Yeah, some of all the cells must equal to one and the, the numbers there cannot be negative because they are all probabilities, okay? And you need to check, okay, that logically you sum up over X and Y, P of X, Y, X, Y must be equal to one, okay? And indeed, I just did a mental check all the red numbers add up to one. Okay, so now given, sorry, I want to use this color. Given a particular event and event A, which is equal to say X, Y, such that X, Y satisfies a certain property, a property P. Then how do we compute the probability of A? All right. So the probability that X, Y belongs to A is nothing but the sum over all possible values of X and Y that belong to A or P of X, Y, X, Y. Now this looks very complicated. Suppose A is the set of all possible values of X and Y such that x plus y is equal to five. Okay, good. So how do we compute the probability of this particular event? Okay, so now look at this, x plus y equals to five. Where are the x plus y's that are equal to five on, in this picture? Um, well, uh, I know one plus four is equal to five. So this, this, is a, this is included, two plus three is equal to five here as well and here as well. So those are the places where x plus y are equal to five, is equal to five, right? So now, when I want to compute this probability, I'm just gonna sum up P of x, y, uh, one, zero, plus P of x, y, 
two, three, plus P of X, Y, three, two, um, this should be one, four, plus P of X, Y, four, one. And this turns out to yield, this turns out to yield zero plus two over 20, plus three over 20, plus zero, which is five over 20. So you see, all that I'm doing is I'm just summing up those cells such that the sum of the values is equal to five. All right, understand? All right. So that's how we compute uh, particular probabilities of certain events of interest, okay? Right, so we have already described what we mean by the joint PMF. The joint PMF can be represented by this matrix or this table, if you wish, this table here. But suppose I want to just recover the marginal PMFs. That means just the PMF of X, okay? The distribution of X, P of X of X. How do I get that? Now recall that P, this probability mass function is nothing but the probability that X is equal to X. But this can be obtained by summing over all possible values of Y, probability that X is equal to X intersect Y is equal to Y. You know why that's the case? What are we using here? What are we using here? We are using a theorem. It starts with, it's the some theorem that we actually employed many times during the lectures and the tutorials. Come on. The y equals to y forms a partition of the sample space. Okay. Y equals to y for various values of y. For uh, various small y forms a partition of the sample space. And hence, what are we using here when I write down this equation? Total probability, exactly. Very good. Okay, so we have that this is nothing but the sum will be all possible values of y, p of x comma y, x y by the definition of the joint probability. So if we are interested in the marginal probability, by the way, this is called marginal, because you only care about x, you can call it x marginal if you wish, marginal probability, mass function, marginal PMF maybe, that's better. If you're interested in the marginal PMF, you sum over all possible values of y. Okay, so for example, if you have this picture again, okay, now am I interested? Now I'm interested in the probability mass function of X. Okay. So now I'm going to draw the probability mass function of X here. So basically now what I have to do is I have to sum over all possible values of Y. So I sum over all these values to give the probability mass function that X is equal to one. Okay. So I have one plus one plus one, which is three over 20. Okay. Now, if I am interested in two, I sum over all possible such values and I get a six over 20, okay? And I sum over all possible such values to get P of X of three, and I get eight over 20. And here I do the same, I get a three over 20. And so here, this is nothing but, I just want to remind you, P of X of one, this is P of X of four. This, what I'm doing here is I'm just basically applying the formula above this formula here. Okay, I'm summing over all possible values of y of the joint. This is what I'm doing. This is exactly what I'm doing. Okay, understand? This is really important. If you can only remember one thing today, you remember this. If you can remember two things, I'll tell you what else to remember. Okay, so now in a completely symmetric way, the probability mass function of y, you sum over all possible values of x of p of x, y, x, y. So the operation is as follows. Suppose I'm interested in p of y1, evaluated at 1. Aha, uh -huh. I will sum over all these values. Oh, sorry, I don't mean to erase this. Sum over all these values to get P of Y of one. That is three over 20. How about P of Y of two? Okay, I sum over all these values, uh, six, seven, right? Okay, I have seven out of 20. And I sum over all these values to get P of Y of three. And that is seven out of 20 as well. And this is three out of 20. P of Y of four. 3 out of 20. So this picture is now a little bit messy, but I hope you understand what I'm trying to do, okay? So I'm trying to evaluate the marginal probability mass functions on X and Y. On X, you sum over the columns. On Y, you sum over across all the rows, 
okay? And here I'm basically implementing, I'm basically implementing this formula here. So that's how we recover the marginal probability mass functions, okay? Now, after we have done this calculation, right? How can we check that we are correct? How can we check that the magenta numbers are correct? The, this magenta. Yes, superb. All right. So we can check. We can check that sum over all possible values of y or py of y is one. And indeed, it's the case. This is a half and this half, one. Right? Because now you're actually summing over across the rows. Then you sum across all the columns. It's the same as you sum over all the entries of the matrix. Right? Similarly, did I make any mistake here? So it is 9 plus 8, 17, 17 plus 3, 20, just nice. Everyone understand? This picture is too cluttered already, but the book does a better job. Understand? So this is how we recover the two marginal distributions or marginal probability mass functions, P of X of X and P of Y of Y. You use these formulas here, but the interpretation in terms of this table is much, much more important. Uh, any questions? I mean, I only know a few names. I know uh, David here. All right, so now we can actually do a little bit more and I don't have to go so fast, All right? So, any questions at all? Let me talk about something else, then we can take a break, all right? So let's talk about um, functions of multiple random variables, say two random variables, okay? Last time we did talk about functions of one random variable, but now, of course, we are grown up people. We have to talk about more random variables. So let's say that we have a certain function that brings us from two random variables to a new random variable Z, okay? So here G is a function of two random variables, X and Y, and it generates, it, let's say, produces a new discrete random variable. Let's just say random variable Z. And we want to try to understand the statistical properties of Z. We want to understand, uh, for example, what's the mean and what's the variance and things like that. So how do we even get the uh, probability mass function of Z? Okay. This is example 2.9. What is example 2 my 9? I think it's, I, I use a lot of examples on the books. Uh, so pardon me, but uh, I think this is a good way for you to actually track what I'm doing. Then you can go back to the book to, to, to see if I made any mistakes. All right. Anyway, I want to figure out what is the uh, probability mass function of Z. This is the probability mass function of a new random variable Z. Now, the way to do this, all right, the formula looks a little bit involved and complicated, but I'm going to describe to you how to actually use it in a moment. So I start about what I mean by this notation is I'm summing over all possible pairs of X and Y such that uh, G of X y is equal to z and i'm taking p of x y x y here okay now once you have done this once you have uh, decided on a particular function and you want to evaluate the expectation value of z there are two ways to evaluate two ways to evaluate say expectation value of z the first way as i mentioned last time find the PMF of Z, which is equal to G of X, Y, and plug into the formula for expectation of Z. Plug into formula expectation value of Z, which is equal to sum over all possible values of Z, PZ of Z multiplied by Z. Okay, so you can just plug into this formula if you wish. But this is what I mentioned last time, too long-winded. Okay, the second method is more direct and use the formula. Use the following formula. That only involves the original joint 
PMF, P of X, Y, X, Y, only involves this. So expectation value of Z, which is equal to expectation value of GXY, you just have to plug into sum over all possible values of X and Y, GXY, PX comma Y, X, Y, like this. Okay, so there are two methods and we'll see that two, these two methods yield the same answer, at least for one particular example. So there's a special case of linear functions or affine functions, if you wish, if you are very pedantic, it's affine functions. Okay, so G of X, Y is equal to say AX plus BY plus C, okay? Then you can actually do expectation value of G, X, Y is nothing but expectation value of this guy AX plus BY plus C. And this expectation last time we showed is linear. So you can actually move the expectation operator inside and you get this, okay, as, as is natural, okay, it's natural. Okay, so as I mentioned, there are two ways to compute the expectation value of Z, which is a function of two random variables X and Y. So let's see that they actually give the same answer for a particular question, okay? So here's an example, and I think uh, David is trying to do us all a favor by telling us what this example is exactly in the book. And I'm gonna do this, X plus two Y. Okay, this is not easy, all right? So again, we have this particular uh, joint probability mass function, okay? So there's a joint probability mass function between X and Y, and it's fully described by this particular matrix or table, okay? And now I'm interested, into, I'm interested in finding the expectation value of Z, all right? So my goal here is to find the expectation value of Z. All right, now I'm gonna do a long-winded way. And after I use a long-winded way, we will call it a break. And then I'll use a shortcut way after the break, all right? The long-winded way is really long-winded, okay? So the PMF of Z can be calculated as PZ of Z equals to what? You're summing over all possible values of X and Y such that X plus two Y is equal to Z of the joint distribution or the joint PMF of X and Y like this, okay? So now the first thing to notice here, right? is very difficult, all right? So what are the values of Z that, what are the values that Z can take on? Now the X and Y, the X and Y, they take on values in one, two, three, and four. So Z takes on values, for example, if both X and Y are one, one, all right? Then Z can be, can be in three, can, be, can take on the value three. Now, if X and Y are the largest possible values for four, all right? Then it can take on values, okay, 12, because you have four plus eight, that gives 12. All right, then there are many values in between that we have to try to figure out, all right? But we'll do that slowly. So now we are basically trying to figure out the, the probability mass function of Z. Let's just do this slowly and figure out the probability mass function of Z evaluated at three, okay? Now, when can Z be equal to three? So now I'm plugging Z equal to three inside here. What values of X and Y yield Z equal to three? How can I get Z equals to three? No, X and Y can take on uh, one, two, three, four. And X plus two Y equals to Z. Now if, okay, if Z is equal to three here, how can I form uh, three from X and Y? What must X and Y be? There's only one choice. Yes, very good. One, one. So basically if I want this three, uh, I basically have looked into this box only, right? So this is the only box that can give me Z equals to three. So that is nothing but P of X, Y, one, one, as exactly what uh, this gentleman told me, one over 20, right? Understand? Now, some of these others are not so, e not so easy. So P of Z of say four, how do I form four? There's only one way I can form four from this formula. Yes, very good. Very confident. So two, one here. X is two, Y is one. Okay. 
So this is nothing but P of X, Y, 2, 1, which is 1 over 20. And this deserves a yellow, right? This deserves a yellow. And that above deserves a blue, right? So this is very, a very laborious process because we must do it until 12. So I'm, doing, I'm not going to do everything because it's too painful. But five, uh, five, how can we form five? There, there's something that's more complicated. Five, mm, how can we form five? Right. How can we form five? Three, one, yes. But that's not the end of the story, I believe. Uh, let me let me try to do this five first, okay? Yes, exactly, one, two here, okay? So this five, uh, PX5 is PXY, uh, three, one, plus PXY, one, two. And the reason is because three plus two times one is equal to five, and five is also equal to one plus two times two. Understand? Yes, you know, okay. Now, uh, so this deserves a green color, all right? And it deserves the number given by uh, 2 over 20, I believe, because you take one plus one, all right? And this deserves a green. So as you can see, this is a very laborious process. And just to answer Oliver's question, three, how do you form three? Well, three is nothing but one plus two times one. So X and Y are one each and you plug into this formula here, okay? In order to get the Z, which is three. One plus two times one is three. Does that make sense, Oliver? Okay. So as you can see, this is a very painful process. And the book actually has given you all the, all the numbers and I'm not going to do it anymore, okay? You can verify that all these numbers are correct or roughly correct. So you just have to basically track through everything. 8 is 3 over 20, PZ of 9 is equal to 3 over 20. I'm, just, I'm going to do the last one. 2 over 20, PZ of 11 is equal to 1 over 20, and PZ of 12. How can we form 12? Okay, now I'm going to ask Oliver already. How, how can I form Z equal to 12? How can I form 12? From x plus 2 y. Only one way. Uh. X4, y4. I mean, 2, x2, y4. This, this, this box here. Okay. This I mean, box. I mean, x2, y4. No, x4. X four and Y also four. Four. I, I think it's X four and Y four. This box here, because if you put number four here, right? Four plus two times four. I think this is twelve, right? Yeah. Mm, so it's this gray box here. Okay. <laughs> I mean, it's very easy to make a wrong mis uh, uh, make some mistakes here, but this is four four. Okay, and this one over twenty. All right, I'm not going to do everything in the intermediate, all right? So you can find out because it's very painful. But after you're all said and done here, you can compute the expectation value of Z, okay? Just by averaging all the numbers that we have so painstakingly obtained. Okay, so Z will run from three all the way to 12. And after you're said and done, you get 7.55, okay? Right, so that's one way. You can figure out the, the, the probability mass function of Z, and then you apply the standard formula. All right. So David Woodside, uh, correct. So now this is a good time to take a break. We'll come back at 3.05. Okay.
call that. Uh, it comes to a lake and sea of life. Whereas if you want to describe the entire joint PMF like this, how many numbers do you have to tell me? Can the last one. Can you tell me 14? Something is right? So, six, from six numbers, you cannot conjure up 15 numbers. So, if you, if you tell me Px and Py only, there's no way for me to generate Txy, the joint content, unless the x and y are so called independent. So, the, so the only way you can destroy Pfs from Lorentzo is that brute forcing. Cannot, you cannot brute force it, cannot. There's no way to brute forcing it. I don't even know what it's brute forcing. So I mean, like for every for every uh, value of x, you find the uh... oh, I call both. Yeah. What one they get two But there's a more uh, encouraging way of doing this. Next, okay. Yeah.
Hello. Um, let us resume. Oh, can the people in Zoom hear me again? All right, so that's great. Okay, so as you can see here in this particular example, if we compute, if we compute the probability mass function PMF of Z in this long-winded way, it takes too much time, okay? So if we want directly the expectation value of Z, it's basically this, there is of course a more direct way of doing so. Okay, so this is method two. All right, this is basically method one. That is to find the probability mass function of Z, which is too, too long-winded, okay? But nevertheless, let us try, to, we have already done the, the long-winded way, let us do the short, shortcut way. So we, we desire the expectation value of Z and Z is equal to X plus two Y. Now, last time we proved that, uh, we showed that the expectation is linear, which means that uh, the expectation can split in this way, can go inside in this way, you can do the following. All right, now, previously, we have already found out what are the probability mass functions of uh, X and Y, okay? Via this uh, marginalization, this process, of, this process of doing this is called marginalization, okay? So our probability mass function of Y is given by the following, okay? So let me just copy it here. That's the probability mass function of y. Maybe you'll put it here. All right, and the probability mass function of x of x is nothing but, maybe I should rewrite this. Okay, I shouldn't be so lazy. X is uh, given by here, x equals to one, x equals to two, x equals to three, and x equals to four. Actually, we've already computed this, so I'm, I'm not going to belabor the point here. And these numbers you can get from above. Three over 20. And I will, I will do the Y again. I will make this look a bit neater. Okay, and we have P of Y of Y. Again, Y can take on four values. Y equals to one, two, three, and four. This is three out of 20, seven out of 20, seven out of 20, and three out of 20. Okay. So the first thing to notice here is that uh, we have to get our hands on the expectation values of X and Y. Okay, and then plug, just plug it into this formula. Now, expectation value of X requires a little bit of effort, but can you see directly without, any, without doing any work, what is the expectation value of Y here? Just eyeball it. Uh, let me call people. Who does not want to be called? Oh, so everyone wants to be called, good. All right, um, yeah. Can, can anyone eyeball and tell me what's the expectation value of Y without writing a single line? You see there's some symmetry here, right? This part here looks the same as this part here, 7373 three here. So if you draw the probability mass function as a, as a stem plot, right? It looks like this. So where's the center of gravity? It is here, it's the center of gravity is here. Can you see that? All right, so Kuvu, and I cannot see the last name, gives me 2.5, which is very good. Exactly correct, because this is the center of gravity. Very good, the zoom person, okay. But can everyone see that actually I can just eyeball this, there's no work to be done here, right? You agree? Okay, just, just to make this clear, right? I can draw this picture here. So sometimes we, we think before we do, we don't always do a lot of work. We must be smart in what we do, all right? So this is three out of 20, seven out of 20, seven out of 20, and three out of 20. So the center of gravity must be between two and three because of the symmetry. So the center of gravity is here. Okay. They use this expectation value. Okay, so there's no work to be done for P of Y, as long as we know how to do averaging. But the expectation value of X requires a, a little bit more work. And so we need to average this, okay? So we have three out of 20 times one, plus six out of 20 times two, plus eight out of 20 times three, times three, plus three over 20 times four. And uh, I'm not gonna belabor this. I'm, I'm not gonna tell you how to press calculator, but it's 51 out of 20. Okay, so the expectation value of Z 
which is equal to expectation value of x plus two times the expectation value of y. You just substitute the numbers in. You have 51 over 20 plus two times 2.5, right? Two times uh, 2.5. So this is again 7.55, all right? So, and that corroborates this, all right? So same, same number, all right? As, as it should be, because the formula must give the same number as the, the long-winded way of doing things. So can everyone appreciate this? Now we only have to get our handle on the uh, marginal and the marginal, and we try to calculate the expectations here. After you have computed the expectations, we plug it straight back into this simple linear formula here, and then we can recover the number, all right? Without having to compute the probability mass function of Z by collating all the constituent XY pairs that yield a particular value of Z. That would be too painful, as you saw here. Do you agree now? Can you see this? All we have to get a handle on is probability mass function of X and that of Y, and their expectation values, and then... Uh, because you can do it the long-winded way, or you can do it my way. You see, the probability mass function of Y is this picture. Can you see that? And here is the center of gravity of all the probability masses, because it's the weight on this side and the weight on this side are the same. So the expectation value must be here. Now, if you want to be very, very careful, right? Then you can compute the expectation value of y. Okay, it is nothing but three over 20 times one plus seven over 20 times two plus seven over 20 times three plus three over 20 times four. Okay, so 14 plus three, 17, 17 plus 21 is 38, 38, but 50 over 20 is 2.5. Same thing, yeah. So you can do it a long-winded way or you can just eyeball the, the center of mass. Is this expectation strictly, okay, right. Thank you very much for the question. So uh, David asks, all right. How about if I have a function that is the following G of X, Y equals to X, Y squared, right? Okay. Can I can do anything? All right. So let, that is Z. All right. Now, now if we want, okay. So this is example. All right. So if we want to control or want to find the expectation value of Z, now this expectation value of x y squared. Right. I'm not doing anything special here, but this is not going to be linear. All right. You cannot move this inside. It's illegal. Very very illegal. Very illegal. Okay, so David, this is uh, illegal. Don't do this, all right? But suppose you want to do shortcuts and you want to make progress from here on. You, you cannot make progress in this direction, okay? This is illegal, but you can do the following. This is nothing but sum over all possible values of X and Y multiplied by uh, of X, Y squared this way. Okay, so you basically put down the function here. Okay, and then you put down the prob it's probability mass function here. So this is some formula that I mentioned here. All right, here, here. So this function can be anything, say x, say David's x y squared. Right, so you can put it down here, and then you just do the averaging with respect to the probability mass function of x and y of this distinguished function x y squared. Okay, All right. So that's that. Okay. Right. So now, whatever we can do for two random variables, we can do for more than two random variables. And this will turn out to be handy. Okay. So let x, y, z be three discrete. Actually, it doesn't have to be discrete. But we follow the book. It's discrete random variables. Then they have a joint probability mass function P, X, Y, Z, X, Y, and Z. That is nothing but the probability that X takes on the value X, Y takes on the value Y, and Z takes on the value Z. So that is called the joint PMF. Now, suppose we are interested in recovering just the PMF on X and Y, and we want to throw away Z. 
So, okay, before I talk about that, how do we visualize this guy? Okay, so just now, if we only have two random variables, right? And we want to visualize this PMF or probability mass function, what we use? We use this matrix or table. So we want to visualize these three random variables. How do we visualize it? Yes, you draw a cube or more generally a cuboid <laughs> because the X, Y, Z need not take on the same number of values. So you have a cuboid here and each subcube here represents the value of P of X, Y, Z. Okay, but I'm not going to draw this. I'm not very good in drawing 3D. Okay, we don't even have to visualize this because once we visualize the, the, the two random variable case, we are good. So suppose we are interested in just the, the, joint, the joint probability mass function of X and Y, then we just sum over all possible values of Z. Here is all possible values of Z of the triple joint. Okay, that's how we recover the uh, pairwise marginal, if you wish, this is only two marginal, marginal on X and Y. And suppose we are more interested in only getting the margin on X only, then we can pick out uh, Y from P, X, Y. This is the usual formula, but whatever is inside here is nothing but this, okay? So we can put this here, all right? And you can just merge the two sums together to have to write down this as Y comma Z of the joint on three random variables. Okay, because, well, this part here, this part here from above is nothing but just this part here. Okay, so this is just some, what I call bookkeeping, all right? So if we are interested, for example, in the expectation value of some function of G, X, Y, Z, you don't go and find the random variable W. You don't want to find this. This is going to be too painful, all right? What we are going to do is just to sum over all possible values of X, Y, and Z, G of X, Y, and Z of the joint probability mass function of X, Y, Z in this way. Okay, so that's some formula and you can use that to find out the expectation value of a new random variable, which is the function of three O ones. Okay. So this will turn out to be handy when we talk about the expectation of some uh, interesting random variables. Okay. So just now we actually computed the expectation value of a Bernoulli random variable, geometric and Poisson at the very beginning of this lecture. What we are missing out on is actually the binomial, okay? Example, expectation of a binomial random variable. Okay, so we motivate this by the following, 300 students in a class, but of course this class does not have so many students, 300 students in a class. And the probability that the student I gets an A is P, is one third, okay? So um, what is the question is, what's the expected number of A's that the professor has to give out? Expected number of A's of students in this class. Now, if you haven't taken this class right, you would expect that the expected number of A's that the professor to give out is 100. Take 300 times one third, right? Oh, because on average, uh, every student has a 33% probability of getting an A. You have 300 students, you take 300 times one third, okay? So that's, that's a logical thing, all right? From, from just common sense. But let us try to formalize this, all right? Let xi be the following indicator random variable, all right? This is called, one zero is called an indicator or Bernoulli random variable. If uh, xi takes on the value one, if the i student gets an A, okay? Otherwise, xi is equal to zero. If the i student does not get an A, all right? So now, Clearly, the X1, X2, all the way up to X300 are um, Bernoulli. Actually, they are independent, but never mind. Bernoulli random variables. Bernoulli means zero, one value, as I mentioned at the start of this lecture, with common, 
probability of success. By success, we mean getting an A, all right? Common probability of success, P equals to one third, okay? So let's say we define X to be X1, maybe S is better, S, okay? S stands for sum, all right? X1, X2, plus all the way up to X300. What is the, what is the distribution of S? So S is a binomial random variable with n equals to 300 trials. That means I'm trying 300 times and probability of success P, which is equal to one third, all right? So I'm basically summing up a bunch of uh, 300 rather binomial, oh, sorry, Bernoulli random variables. Each one of these guys is a Bernoulli. All right, Bernoulli random variables. Each one of these is one of them. And the sum of uh, n Bernoulli random variables is nothing but a binomial random variable with 300 trials and probability of success p. All right. And in particular, px of k is nothing but 300 choose k. So basically, out of the 300 students, I need to choose k to give an a, but those smart ones. All right. The probability of anyone getting an a is one third. And the probability of someone getting not an A is two thirds, 300 minus K. And so here K can run from zero to 300. Everyone could get an A, no one could get an A, all right? And zero otherwise. Okay, so that's the probability mass function of a binomial random variable, as we have seen before. There's nothing surprising here, nothing surprising at all, okay? Now, suppose I would like to compute the expectation value of X. Okay, so what, what would I do if I didn't know about uh, multiple random variables? What would I do? Okay, so the, the natural thing to do is to do the following. K running from zero to 300 of K, Px of K. Plug into the formula. Plug into the formula, okay? So now you're summing from K equals to zero to 300. K multiplied by 300 choose K. One third to the power of K, two third to the power 300 minus K. Now, Frankly, I tell you, I do not know how to evaluate this. I do not know how to evaluate this sum here. Okay, because it's too complicated. All right, without this k here, right, this sums to one because this is a probability mass function, it must sum to one. But we, if you put this k here, everything gets screwed up. So to compute the expectation of a binomial random variable is actually not so simple if you use the pure form of its uh, PMF. So we need some other way of doing so. And, and we resort to this particular equation here, all right? So, so oh, by, by the way, this S, the sum, okay? And this should be, oh my gosh, oh, this should be S, okay? I mean the sum, okay? So uh, in order to do this, we recall that S is nothing but the sum of N, of uh, rather 300 random variables that are Bernoulli. Bernoulli means zero one value, only take on two values. But you know, by the linearity of expectation, that means all the, because the, this is a sum, so you can move the expectation, distribute the expectation throughout X2 plus all the way up to expectation of 300. Aha, now each one of these guys here is a Bernoulli random variable. And we, at the beginning of this lecture, have already computed the expectation value of a Bernoulli random variable. And that is nothing but P plus P plus dot, dot, dot plus P. So that gives how much? Uh, N times P, which is 300 times uh, one third, which is 100. So on average, you expect, the professor expects to give 100 A's. And the reason is because the expectation of the Bernoulli random variable, the expectation of the Bernoulli random variable S, it's nothing but a sum of n expectations where each of the expectations is that of a Bernoulli random variable x, okay? So we, we bypass the having to do this very complicated sum. Is that clear? I do not know how to do this, but I know how to do this expectation just by plugging the sum of this this can be represented as sum of Bernoulli random variables. Each one of these is a Bernoulli random variable with probability of success one third, okay, or P, 
All right. And each one of these expectations has probability P. All right. And there are 300 of them. And I get 100. Is that clear? Is that clear? I, I think it's very clear, right? Okay. Uh, basically, I don't like to do this sort of thing because it's too complicated. There's a way to do it, if you wish. But uh, there's a much simpler way just by using. Here, what are we using? We are basically using this formula here, okay? And linearity of expectation. The expectation is linear. Okay, so now here's a question for you. And this question is not in the book. All right. What is the variance? What is the variance of S, which is the sum of a bunch of uh, independent Bernoulli random variables? Now, you may, not know, you may not really know how to do this at this point in time because I've not talked about some things. All right, but you can keep this question in mind. You can keep this question in mind. There are some concepts that I've not talked about. And in particular, I've not talked about, for example, what is the variance of X plus Y? Okay. So without this, you, you may not know how to answer this question properly. All right, but you can keep this in mind. And we may want to answer this later on, okay? It's not so critical right now. Okay, so uh, let me go through one final example and then we can call it a day a bit earlier today, okay? All right, so because I, I finished talking about whatever I want to talk about, let's just consider the hat problem, which is also not very difficult, okay? The hat problem. That is a problem in the book as well. So you have N people, okay? And each of the persons throws, say these are all men, okay, and men, because I don't want to deal with uh, having to talk about gender, and men, and each person throws his hat into a box, and and then picks up one hat at random at random, uniformly, out of the end heads that are inside. So everyone throws his head into a box, and then the box, of course, um, is concealed. You cannot see what is inside the box. And then after everyone throws the head inside the box, all right, so there's a box here, and there's a bunch of heads here, many heads, but uh, you cannot see that, all right? Everyone just, puts his hand inside the box and picks out a hat. It could be his hat originally, or it could be someone else's hat, all right? So what is the expected number of people who pick their own hat, okay? So the question is, what's the expected number of people, of men who pick back their own hat? Note that everyone has his or her, his, his only. Everyone has one hat. So you have the uh, Oliver hat, all right? Then you have the uh, Liao Xue hat, all right? And then I have my own hat. We all throw our hats into the box. Then we're going to pick it up again, all right? So the way to do this is the following. Let Xi, we define Xi to be a Bernoulli random variable, one, zero. Uh, the, so I succeeded. I person picked his own head. Okay, so this I person was very lucky and he picked back his own head and otherwise. So now we're gonna define S, all right, which is X1 plus X2 plus dot, 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 plus Xn. Okay, so S represents the total number of what, what does it represent? Number of people or men who picked their own head. Okay, because why? Okay, uh, if this is one, one, and everything else is zero, it means that two people, and in particular, the first two people pick their own head and everyone picks someone else's head, right? So uh, if this is one and that is one, it means that the first person and the last person picked their own head and everybody in the middle did not pick their own head. 
correct? Uh, so this is not so difficult, right? So every one of these numbers is one zero. Basically, we are counting how many people pick their own head. You're lost on this one. Okay. Since you're lost, we will mention this. We will talk about this again for David. All right. So the story is as follows. We have N people. Say myself. I only know, I only know, oh, I know three names here. Say four people, all right? Myself, Liao Xue, David, and Oliver. We have four people. Each one of us has our own head. They are labeled A, B, C, D, all right? Okay, so A, B, C, D heads get thrown a priori at the very beginning. We throw our heads into this box, but this box, we cannot see it, okay? After we throw it in, we cannot see anymore. So it's concealed to us, okay? Okay, finish, or we, we have thrown the heads A, B, C, D into the box. Now, we are going to pick our head, oh, sorry, we are going to, each one of us is going to put our hand into the box and pick out one head, okay? So what, what can happen? Well, I may pick my own head or I may pick Liao Xue's head or I may pick Oliver's head. If I pick my own head, then X Vincent is one. Okay, if I don't pick my own head, X Vincent is zero, okay? So Oliver also picks his head, also picks some head from the box. So if he picks his own head, he gets one, otherwise zero. Now we define this new random variable S, which is the sum of all the Xs. What does this represent? This represents the total number of people who pick their own head. Because this is activated, each of the Xs is activated means one, if and only if the I person picks his or his or her own head, right? Now, what are you saying? Iteratively, wouldn't the sample size decrease each time? No, we are not doing this iteratively, okay? Everyone is going to just pick their own head at the same time. So we are, we are four people are going to put our hands into the bucket and pick the head, okay? okay? It's, not, it's not a sequential process. Okay. Any case, in any case, what is the probability that xi is equal to one? Okay, there are n heads, and I'm going to put my hand inside there to pick one of the n heads. Is one over n, uniformly at random. Oliver, oh uh, no, David, okay. So the probability that xi is equal to zero is of course one minus one over n. These two must add up to one. Okay, so the expected number of people who pick their own head is nothing but expected value of x1 plus expected value of x2 plus dot 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 plus expected value of xn. This is true, sorry, this is true for all i running from one to n, this equation here. But the expectation value of xi for every i, okay, is Bernoulli, right? One is basically one times the value one over n plus zero times one minus one over n. And this of course one over n. So plugging this into this, okay, so we have this, plugging this calculation into this sum here. All right, we have basically one over n plus one over n plus dot 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 plus one over n. And how many times do we have this? N times, this is one. So on average, on average, only one person recovers his head. Only one person recovers that. This is a little bit, I mean, surprising if you wish. Sorry, uh, I'm only mentioning men here, but uh, let's say there's a woman involved in this game also. Okay. So this is one way of using the linearity of expectation here. Okay. And actually computing the expectation value of S. The expectation value of S is of course, expectation value of X1 plus X2 plus dot, dot, dot plus Xn. But expectation is linear. So this part here gets out and this part here, you can basically move the expectation operator inside, okay? Like this, okay? And you can calculate each one of the individual expectations. They are all the same. They are all one over N and they are N copies of this. So of course you will recover one, okay? 
Right, this is where I want to stop today. We are ending a little bit early. I hope you don't mind. All right. Um, you can attempt uh, tutorial four. Uh, it's always good to attempt the questions. I know it's a bit long, but uh, you can attempt tutorial four and then you can uh, enjoy it. The last two prongs are not so easy. Okay. So, um, yeah, thank you for submitting the homework. It's being graded at this point in time. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, people in Zoom, uh, thanks for your kind attention and for your participation. And I'll see you around. Do attend the tutorial today. I'm very pleased there are so many people attend my tutorial. Uh, okay, see you. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye.